So what are the most important characteristics of a leader? Um, for me, the most important characteristics are uh, empathy, um, understanding, care. I think they're things that sometimes are quite undervalued. Obviously, you often see leaders at the, at the forefront of teams, of organisations, of anything, and I think a lot of the time people take leadership as, um, you know, people directing you and telling you what to do and, you know, those sorts of things. But to me, a really great leader is someone that can hold empathy for others and, and care and understanding and build those relationships. And I think that's the best way to lead a group of people when they know that you're invested in them, they're going to follow you. So for me, um, that they'd be some of the most important characteristics. Um, and, yeah, I think, like I said, I think they can be quite undervalued or or things that people don't often straight away pin to a leader. How have you tried to develop as a leader? So for me, um, this year's been obviously a bit of a different one for me. I would always say that my strengths as a leader has been um, my on-field, I guess, attributes and, and characteristics and, and the way that I lead on-field has probably always been um, I guess my strengths. Um, I definitely think I've had elements of off-field, but it's really pushed me this year to try and find other elements and, and areas of my leadership having done my knee. Um, I faced the same thing back in 2018 when I was playing for Carlton and was the captain there and I did my knee in, in round two. And yeah, I had to, I had to find other ways. And I, I believe I've tried to do that this year. I've tried to, you know, get around the girls off-field. Um, I've tried to, you know, when I when I see things in the game, I've tried to impart my knowledge or help the girls with that. But yeah, it's it's been tough not being able to lead the way I want to. When you have harder moments of why do I bother or why do I do this, uh, what is it you come back to that drives you to go on? So for me, I think for me, the whole thing about footy and being part of a team is something that really drives me. Um, I know for a fact that if this wasn't a team sport, I don't know if it would be something that I'd be involved in. I love to work with people. I love to see other people succeed. I love to push myself, be challenged by other people. I love to learn from other people. And um, that's what that, that's what makes me keep coming back. This is, this is my second, I, I, I've done my ACL for the second time now and you know, you could sort of say, oh, I'm, I'm 27. Um, I might have a handful of years left of footy, um, maybe a small handful, depending on how my body holds up. But um, I think what makes me keep coming back and what will make push me through this rehab is my teammates and, and the people around me and wanting to be better and get, and you know, be able to play the best footy I can and return to the field and, and be the leader that I, I want to be as well. So I, I would say that's what drives me. Um, it's the people, it's the fact that I'm so like, competitive, like I, I love to compete and they're the things that, um, that I want to come back for and when I have some hard times, that's, that's why I do this. So what is your process for dealing with adversity? So injuries and what goes through your head? Um... Oh, look, it's, yeah, it's a good question. And for me, and I've, this is, a, I've, I've done my knee for the second time. I did my first knee in 2018 when I was playing at Carlton and now done my knee in round one of the season just passed with Collingwood. And I think for me, what keeps, I guess what keeps me going and, you know, allows me to deal with it is that I guess sometimes you do have to have a little bit of perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I can feel like this is a sucky situation and I can, I can grieve and I can be upset um, because it's a long rehab and it can be very tedious and, and emotional as well at times. But, you know, there's, there's people that have gone through a lot worse. And I think for me, this is a little hiccup in the road for me. It's, it's a year of hard work. It's going to be a year of a bit of tears. Um, and yeah, I guess a 12 month period where there will be ups and downs. But for me, I sort of constantly go back to, 
it's not the worst thing, I'm not dying. Um, there's, there's people in really horrible situations and people who have had very close experiences to that and um, I think that's what, what motivates me to, to pick myself up on those really, you know, bad days or the days where I don't feel very good um, because at the end of the day, I've got a sore knee and that's that's what it is. I've got to I've got to fix it and it does as an athlete it's it's sort of the injury you don't want to do but um I've done it before and I can get through it again. So that's how I would how I deal with the adversity. So why should people care about women's sport and footy? <sighs> why should they? Because it's bloody great. <laughs> um, sport is literally, and footy in general, that's, they're such great sports and, and when we're talking about the women's space, it's more than just the game. We have such an inclusive environment. We have an environment full of different, different types of people, different backgrounds and, you know, different identities, different sexualities and just different um, in general. And we all really embrace each other and get around each other and for me, that's the coolest thing to be a part of, a place where it's so accepting and so inclusive and so diverse. Um, and on top of that, like, the footy's awesome. Like, it's every single year we see it get better and it's only going to continue to. And I think it speaks volumes that we've got so many young girls playing and signing up to Auskick and football clubs now. And, you know, we you compare that to 10 years ago and it just wasn't the same, or even six years ago before the AFLW even sort of began. Um, you didn't see that the number of or the volume of girls running around because there wasn't there wasn't an option. Um, so football wasn't the chosen sport for women or for young girls. But now it can be, and you can see the impact of what the AFLW has had already. Um, so for me, you know, if if you're someone who hasn't watched much of the women's space, like I encourage you to be patient. Um, we haven't had a hundred years or so of playing footy like you know the men's have, and they've been able to sort of develop their brand and then go go from se semi-professional or part-time to full-time professional. Um, so be patient with us. Like I said, the footy is getting better every year, and you know if you, I, I I encourage you to think about the you know the girls, the young girls or the women in your life, and how this could impact them and if they were playing, like what, what would you feel, how would you feel if they were playing, your daughter's running out there for one of the teams, you know? Um, I'm sure you'd get behind it, I'm sure you'd support it. So, you know, I, I encourage you to think of those things when when you are thinking of giving women's footy a try or, you know, women's sport in general, think about those people, have them in front of mind when, when you decide to, I guess, pass judgment or criticise or whatever it is. Um, but. People should care about women's sport. People should care about footy because it's bloody awesome. And it's as simple as that. So which person has had the greatest impact on your life? Okay, this one will make me emotional. Um, I haven't even started yet. <laughs> um, Look, I've got a lot of great people in my life um, and, like, I can't really separate too many of them, if I'm being honest, but if I had to pick one, it would have to be my mum. Um, not only has she been there for me, like, through my whole career with soccer, footy, um, everything like that, I think she has really taught me a lot of values that I'd like to... Um, I suppose have as a person now. So just things like her strength, her resilience, um, her ability to adapt, bounce back. Um, my mum has had her health struggles and I guess that's where a lot of my learnings have come from. Obviously, she's, she's an amazing woman and someone I love a lot and she's taught me and my siblings what strength looks like. Um, what it looks like to be resilient um, and also what it looks like to have such a positive outlook on life and to to keep pushing on even when it gets tough. And I think 
when I think of things like my knee injury, it's there's nothing in comparison. So, as in, my mum literally was told that you you could die on the table here. We've got to operate, but there's no there's no promises we can make for you. And she still had such a positive outlook on life and went about her life as best she could and lived it as best she could. And so for me, that's really inspiring. And she's definitely had the greatest impact on me um, with the with the things she's taught me through her character and through the things that she's been through. So. Um. I actually need to take a moment, sorry. Mums are so important and so are dads. Um, and losing either would be so hard. I know I've got friends who have lost mum, mums or dads young and, or, you know, parents, and I've always wondered how they've gotten through it, if I'm being honest. Um, and I've always admired those who show such strength when, when something that horrible has happened to them. Um, and for me, the most vulnerable I've ever felt is thinking that my mum was going to be not around anymore. Oh, my God. <laughs> um... So my mum's had numerous brain surgeries for aneurysms in her head and every single time she'd she'd get the same chat. You just letting you know like possibility is you could die on the table. Or just letting you know the possibility is that you won't you won't come back in the same personality. You won't have feeling in your legs. Um, every single time. That is probably when I've felt most vulnerable because I, I do not know what I would do without my, my mum and my dad, but losing a parent to me is, makes you, makes you vulnerable and that is thinking about losing mum and even the possibility of it, that is when I felt the most vulnerable. I remember her, the last brain um, operation that she had, <clears throat> the surgeon said, you know, this one is the most risky one we're gonna, we've, we've had to do up to date. She had a really tiny aneurysm in a really tricky spot. Um, to the point where a lot of surgeons didn't want to operate. Um, and finally one put up his hand and said, I will pull, pull up, but you'd need to understand the risks. It is very risky and your percentage of, you know, you know, death on the table or something severely being impacted here is very high. And so we knew this with her going into this operation and um, it's the most scared I've ever felt. It's the most vulnerable I've ever felt. And I remember saying bye to her and um, the medical people said, you know, we'll, we'll call you guys when, we'll call you when it's finished and we'll let you know how she goes. Um, and brain operations go for a very long time. They're six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours. It really just depends on, on the situation. But in this situation, it was going to be a long one because of how tricky it was. And I remember hopping in the car to go home and we were all sort of in tears. We'd said bye to mum and sort of kept a straight face because we wanted to be like, you're going to be fine. But we all knew how risky the situation was and what the chances were. So, of course, we were all terrified. Um, and then we get a call an hour later and I remember my older sister picking up the phone and my face just dropped because I was like... <laughs> I was like, brain operations, they don't go that short. So she's, I thought she was dead. 
Um. Yeah, I thought she was dead. And then <sighs> on the other end, um, like I said, my older sister picked up the phone, but on the other end, they basically said, come and get your mum. We actually scanned her brain just before taking her in and the aneurysm has gotten so small that we that we don't need to operate anymore. So that was the most, I don't know, I guess it was the most vulnerable time, the most scary time, but also the most relieving time at the same time because at literally when I saw the phone call, like I said, I thought mum was gone. And then two, a minute later, I hear that she's coming home. So it was a pretty crazy time, but definitely one where I felt the most vulnerable. And we're very lucky that she's still here, but she constantly needs to get her brain scanned to make sure that she's okay. So, um, yeah, we do need to, yeah, we're constantly she needs to get her brain scanned to make sure that the aneurysms haven't grown or anything like that. But so far, so good. She has a yearly scan usually and um, she's been okay up until this point and we obviously just continuously hope that's the case. But, yeah, well, it's a very long answer, but that's what, when I've felt the most vulnerable. And I don't want to go through that again, if possible. <laughs>